and absence of hope. Silenus gets worse. At some point, forgetting the world around him, he stumbles to the side of the sudden town and tries to piss as we fly down the road. No one realizes what he's doing until the wind carries his urine into the face of all the marines behind him on his side of the truck. Junior marines who would never have been so bold in life are shouting like a fuck at him. Someone throws an empty water bottle and explains what in life would have been obvious. At some point here, everybody loses their mind. At the next hot check, Salinas is losing consciousness. A corpsman is summoned from one of the other vehicles and an IV is placed and fluids are running to his big bodies and stretched into a different vehicle. The VCs on the escort victors are ir irritated and anxious. Treating Salinas is taking too long. We've been sitting in one spot for more than a few minutes and in hell, this can be lethal. Speed is safety. Their anxiety is contagious. The tension doesn't lapse until we're Oscar Mike again. On the moon. At all time, the presently damned are only mildly amused by the constrained state of their new rivals. Fear of humor doesn't have the power of relief that it had in life. You hear the reassurance, don't no worry, you get used to it. And eventually, incredibly, you do. Yet heat is always part of the torment of the damned. When you leave for ops after you pass the gates of the fog, hell, even hell has its forms of sanctuary. Your driver guns the accelerators and hits the highway leading to town. Speed is safety. The cooling towel, desperately struggling to take heat from the straining engine, blasts your face and told that your lips are chapped with bleeding. You learn why, even in this heat, the present began to wrap their faces with scarves like kids going out to play in the snow. On overwatch, or on a pause, eight days for sleeping. Only the Marine behind the 240 golf machine gun stays awake, monitoring the radio for traffic and watch standards light on the other victors. He'll endure two hours of torment before his relief swaps places with him in the VC's hatch and finds a spot of hot shade on the rocky ground beside the vehicle to curl up and take a nap. Oblivious of the camel spiders, scorpions, and snakes that are all equally desperate to find shelter from the sun. Heat or no, he, there's a mission to be accomplished. Then again, accomplished isn't really the appropriate word. He can never accomplish this mission. He can only go through the motions of trying to accomplish it. Again and again and again, performing tasks without the hope of results. This is appropriate for him. You conduct patrols along the Syrian border looking for smugglers you can never catch. You know they're there. You see the brakes in the burn along the border where they've made the crossing. The IDPs laughing, speaking to each other in Arabic. You imagine they must find the lunacy of their mission and use it. Repair the burn. It'll be broken again in a week or a day. Too much border for one company of Marines to manage, an exercise in futility. As a Marine, you're accustomed to chicken shit, but now people are dying as a result. Despair, fatalism, prayers and promise of anything to God, but please just let me get through this. Later in the deployment, the informant explains that the IDPs are signaling the smugglers and the Marines are there and guiding them to see places to cross. Routine keeps the mind busy. BCPs, coordinate knock, some bureaucrats coming for home invasion. Patrols, night patrols are the best. Who would have thought the night sky in hell so beautiful? Moving across the desert in dark skin through green MDGs and black and white EDD, hooking a CD player up to your Charlie box so the crew can listen to music and pass time as you drive for hours, looking for bad guys you'll never find. You learn to use the sky to, as a compass to navigate between GPS checkpoints. Polaris is north, moving with the star over your left shoulder is east, your right shoulder is west, and centered over the back of your turret is south. Your platoon of armored vehicles moves with lights out, vehicles grumbling and screaming in the dark, staying off the road to avoid landmines. You make stops at IDP stations so the lieutenant can make a head count, which is surprised no one the hell is corrupt. The IDPs are drawing pay from our government. They have the names of fictitious guards for their roster to pack the bill. We stop periodically to set in and watch for signs of leaving the long border. Out in the desert, away from the town, with miles of flat land and clear fields of fire in every direction. You can almost feel safe. Sooner or later, though, you have to go back through the town. You have to go through the town because your fog is on the south side of the Euphrates, and your AO is on the north. There are only two places to cross the river, and it doesn't take a tactical mastermind to recognize that if you want to kill Marines, these two places are points, points to do it. Everyone you know who died in theater died within a mile of these two bridges. It's only after seven months of IEDs and ambushes that the command acknowledges that allowing the Iraqi police to guard these crossings might be a bad idea. This, even after it's discovered that the machine gun used in the first ambush on the company was checked out at the local police station. Even the perimeter of the town is dangerous. Landmines are pervasive. When the insurgents learn that a single anti-tank mine will not penetrate the whole of our vehicles, they begin stacking the first two and then three one on top of each other. They still barely breach the hole, but it hardly matters. The concussion
compression alone shatters your drums, damages the soft fragile body organs of the vehicle's occupants. The vague long-term effects of those blasts become mysterious ailments that medical officers cannot explain, and the staff, always concerned about rosters and TO requirements, suspects are evidence of malingering rather than maladies. Men lose consciousness, have seizures, forget where they are or what they're doing. They have mysterious pains and fractured vertebrae. Their complaints about stiffness and aches should be coming in their octogenarians, hot kids in their teens or early twenties. If you wonder what kind of future they have as your company racks up the highest per capita for the heart count in the tower. The highest for the exception of the patient jump. The jump takes 80% casualties and you break for every time of year where the jump casualty for having been spared that summer. Their casualty rate is so hard, so high in part because the meth commander, here to show that he owns Ramadi, takes the jump out on the same streets regularly and looking for a fight. The insurgents given him. The insurgents. The term is Latin. Insurgere, used to describe those who rise up against authority. They, the Romans, like so many others, tried to control this area too. Their leaders controlled the same ground as stand upon struggling in an equally futile mission. In the end, they, as we eventually will, called it quits. The genetic reminders of previous would-be conquerors are written into the flesh, flesh of the permanent residents of hell. Blue green eyes and dark faces. Eyes that linger in their minds still. You see the hostile eyes of a teenager who held a gunpoint during the BCP, his father trying desperately to distract you from his son's flaunt and hatred for you, all the while chastising his son in Arabic for the stupidity of staring down the all too eager to shoot first in the means. You come away knowing that if the boy is not already an insurgent, he soon would be. You recall the beaming eyes full of childish joy and gratitude of a girl of three or four as you handed her a ziplock bag of hard candy sent to her home. And you can't help wondering what her life would be like in this place where if you see the slide to her home part of the culture of power. Then, always, you see the eyes of the residents of the town as you make the perilous passage from south to north, from north to south. Eyes carefully in their emotion. Practice blank expressions on the faces of the locals as you thunder past their mud houses and shops looking down from the turret of your victor, bristling with weapons, ostensibly there for security and stability operations, but feeling your presence provided neither. Looking at those eyes and knowing they were all part of the insurgency, even when they passively, IED and landmine strikes against the company are all but daily occurrence. IEDs are placed in high traffic areas in the middle of the town, but were never warned. Rocket assisted mortars are launched at the fog several times a month. Counter battery radar indicates they're being fired from the center of the town, but the locals never see a thing. In eight months, not a single worker has the misfortune to be injured by the indiscriminate landmines, but we're planked by them, constantly aware that no piece of ground in the town is safe. The locals all seem to know the areas to avoid. The phantom insurgents have the upper hand. They could be anyone. The innocent, if there are such in hell, look, act, and sound like the guilty. In hell, resignation to one's fate is part of the culture. Acceptance of unjust treatment is known with the When questioning bound and blindfolded detainees, threats are meaningless. Their fate, however great, is the will of God. The psychic landscape of hell is as bleak as the physical. You're mired in its hatred, violence, poverty, despair, grief, and terror. Complacency kills. Complacency is inevitable. No one can sustain the ramped up adrenaline fuel a terrified state of alertness they have on first in country. Your mind looks for escapes, thoughts of life, home, and the future. The escape lasts until you walk back to reality by the next explosion. You listen to the calm chatter to hear who was hit, who was hurt. Sometimes the peculiarity of the laws of physics reverse the situation. The calm chatter, the panicked voices, contact, 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 or Warlord 6, Terminator 3, actual, stand by for sit rep of medevac request, starts before the sound of the blast reaches, reaches your victor. Always you hope for a near miss. Too frequently you're disappointed. On a wall in the sergeant's breaking at all time, the next the graffiti is written in the major mind. Requiem eternal NIA's domine and Luke's perpetual Luciani. Below this are the names of Marines whose helmets and dog tags have been placed about the stocks of rifle stamp being at first in the same, and whose names will only be called again at the final ceremonial formation. Whose wives and parents will not see them step from the jubilant crowd of Marines who used to post upon their green. They are the names of those whose absence is an unbelievable aching vacuum and a constant source of questions in the minds of those who survive them. In health, fate plays no favorites. Shipbirds and car chargers are equally exposed. The Marines on point for the division jump are killed by a car bomb on the other side of the six-lane highway. Too far away to be perceived as a threat, 